welcome to RETV. RETV is Reality Education Television. It's where we take the education out of the classroom and bring it into the community. It's where we talk about social ills, we talk about education, we talk about ministry, we talk about where your passion lies. Today, we will be talking to Reno. Kanoe Reynolds and Waj Mahali. Okay, and these are two awesome dynamite women of God. And I'm going to let you introduce them because I know I cannot give them justice. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Okay. Well, my name is Kanoe Reynolds and I am originally from Newport News, Virginia. I reside in Waldorf, Maryland now. I have three wonderful boys well on their way to their success. I also uh, own Chat and Chew, Empowerment Women's Chat and Chew with Kanoe, and God's Magnificent Jewels Mentoring Program. Thank you. My name is Wajma Khalili. I'm a single mother of a wonderful child named Sarah Khan. Uh, I work part-time. I got two associates, a bachelor in Tila, holding two master's degrees, and pursuing my PhD in uh, doctorate educational organizational leadership. And I also published four books. Uh, my main book, uh, the last, the fourth one called The Pain Cost by 9-11, basically to bring peace between religions and ethnicities and color, no matter who you are, to basically get together and love one another. No matter you are Christian, Muslim, Buddhism, just love one another, respect one another, be there for one another as a big support. So that's my main passion, to basically stop the discrimination among every ethnicity, every religion. And that's it. All right. All right. And today we will be talking about discrimination, love, hate, faith, and in the midst, where is the healing? Okay? What we're going to do is I'm going to ask these, I'm going to ask Kanoi and Washma questions. And she's joining in on the team. And what's your name? Kelly. Kelly. I'm going to ask some questions, and you will have the opportunity to make comments after they answer. We're going to then turn it over to you, and you can be able to also participate on the panel. Now, the first question that I'm going to ask is, what is discrimination? Yeah, I'm going to ask you, Washman, first. What is discrimination? What is discrimination to you? Discrimination to me is when... Basically something that you have no knowledge about the other person and you just kind of hate on that person with passion. Like, I was thrown a Coke of McDonald's on my face. I was a spit on my face. The people didn't even know me just because I was wearing a symbol of me Allah because I'm Muslim. They had no clue who I am. I was just not even talking to them. I was called names. I was thrown sh heel shoes on my face. I had my tire get cut and punctured. I had uh, people called me name, like when I when I was doing survey for my book, The Pain Caused by 9-11, there was a lady, she was uh, taking the survey when she read the President Obama's name, she just screamed, she said, I thought you're educated, he's a black man, this belongs to a white people and this is a white house, it doesn't call black house, I'm like, whoa, okay, <laughs> that's your opinion and God bless you and I just walked away. Went to the next person. She she had a she was holding a baby. She was pushing the stroller with one hand, and she had a lots of shopping bags in her hand. That's also in, in this book. And I asked. I said, I know I have survey to go around, but would you mind if I help you? And she was going through a lot. And she said, Sure. So I took all of her bag, put it in her trunk, and gave her a hug. She said, Thank you so much. I said, Would you mind to go ahead and take my survey for me? She said, Oh, for an angel woman like you, why not? So she was taking my survey and she said, what, Obama, what's wrong with you? Obama is black, didn't you see that? Okay, where did that come from? You could just put your opinion there. So I just took it and left. So people even don't know Obama's authenticity of what is in his heart. People discriminate against him because he's, he's colored. People discriminate against me. I'm a very highly educated woman. Because I'm Muslim, I'm woman, and I'm color. Okay, so stop right there. Wow. We'll stop right there.
what she brought out was discrimination in what? Race, mm -hmm. religion, mm -hmm. and even job. Mm -hmm. They said, President Obama shouldn't have that position because he was black. Not that he is not qualified, but because he's black. But now I want you to share with what does discrimination means to you. Discrimination means to me is just someone not <clears throat> loving one someone equally behind what they may don't may have and what someone may not have. That's what discrimination is to me, just being treated very, very unfair and unjust for no reason because you may be called to be different from what someone else may be. Fortunately, in my life, I have not had a lot of discrimination. But if I have, God has just given me the grace to overcome it and the mercy to not feel it. So I have to say I thank him for that. Uh, I would say discrimination. I grew up in Arkansas, um, and growing up as a little girl, I didn't really see color. And where I lived, you didn't see color. I had, you know, white people that were I considered my aunts. They called me their niece or whatever. But uh, I remember one time, all the elected officials came to City Hall. And I was with my friend Carol Green, little white girl with green eyes. And we had our, we were all hugged up, and they took a picture of us, and it was on the front page of the newspaper the next day. And the next day, we were no longer friends. Mm -hmm. And I asked my grandmother, I said, why, why won't she be my friend? And she said, because some people think when you're different, when you don't look like them or have what they have, then they don't want to associate with you. And so at that point, little girl, probably about five or six years old, I learned that discrimination really, I didn't have any control with it because I didn't determine what color I was or where I grew up or how much money we made. But people just choose not to like you. They choose to separate themselves from you based upon your color, based upon what you have, based upon where you live, on one side of the track or on the other side of the track. So, so many things, whether you're educated or not, they decide that you're different and they're better. And so they choose not to, you know, be with you. Right. So I guess you said, how does discrimination bring forth healing? Discrimination can bring forth healing when you begin to look at discrimination as to what it is. And we know that discrimination is not something that is good, but you can turn it to good. When it provokes you, when it moves you to be able to do something positive out of the negative. Say for instance, like Washman. Like Washman. Washman said the way she was treated in 9 11 is the way that. Nobody should be treated, whether you're black, white, whatever. The way she was treated, she decided she's going to do something about it, the way she's been treated. It's, she, she also showed that you can continue to love. That's where the healing comes in. When you can be able to love that person regardless of whether they're on the wrong side of the track, or whether they're on the right side of the track, or whether they're on no track at all. That means they're homeless, they're smelly. You, you, you see what I'm saying? In other words, discrimination has no, really it has no color. It's really a satanic, demonic force that Satan used to try to keep the people apart. In bondage. In bondage. And we know that bondage belongs to who? The enemy. The enemy. So it's a technique, it's a tool to be used by the enemy to keep you from walking in your purpose and destiny that God has for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. The next one we're going to do is God's love and a genuine friendship. How has that made a difference in your life? First of all, how many people know God? Amen. Okay. How many people know Jesus? 
how many people have had a personal encounter with Jesus. Okay. I'm going to give you a scripture, and I think everybody knows the scripture. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. When he so loved the world, was there any discrimination in that? No. no. That was not Muslim, not Muslim. That was not a Catholic, a Jew. He, what he did? He said, the world. world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Come on, finish it up for me. Come on. Shall not perish, but shall have life. Ooh. That doesn't speak anything about death at all, does it? In fact, it said, not perish. Not perish. Now, let's, let's, let's identify, let's define what perish means. What does perish mean to you? Perish does not perish. It doesn't go away. It remains. Okay. What is perish to you? Um, so, to perish means to, to die or to um, go away. So the opposite. Okay. Wait, did I say that wrong? Hold on. Hold on. You said not. You said you said right. You said yeah. not perish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perish. Basically, to time to go for you. Time is on your side. Yeah. Time is on your side. Yeah. Okay. So it it it, it continues to where? An eternity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we hate. What is hate? I want to ask someone, disliking yeah. someone. I want to ask somebody in the audience. Have any of you, and, and I want you to be for real, have any of you hate something so bad that you want to do something about it? Mm -hmm. Whether it's negative or whether it's positive. Is that anybody? Raise your hand. Okay. Did you want to elaborate on that? Um, yes. Um, I grew up in a home. My dad used to drink, and he would fight my mother. And I hated what he did and more who he became when he drank. And one particular time, um, my dad had uh, got into an argument with my mother. And he <clears throat> picked up a chair, actually, to hit her, and she blocked it with her arm. So her arm was broken in three places. But that night, I was so, I hated so much. I wanted the, to end, I wanted to stop what he was doing to my mom. And I actually got a knife, uh, and I was 10 years old, planning to kill my father because he was hurting my mother. And I was wise enough to let him go to sleep, but my brothers saw the knife, and they took the knife from me. I was 10, so this is 1967. My parents both passed in 2005. They stayed together. And I watched God turn my dad from the drinker to someone different. So I saw Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, two people, two personalities in the same man. I saw who he was under the influence of alcohol and who he was not under the influence of alcohol. And by the time they both passed, they have both, um, they loved the Lord. They were both born again believers in Jesus Christ. But I hated the secrets as well. And I wanted to tell. And I kept that secret a long time myself because I thought that made me a bad person. Because I wanted to kill my own dad because he was hurting my mom. And people knew, but I'm from North Carolina and back during that time, children were seen and not heard. And you kept secrets in the house. So I hated secrecy. But that also helped me hide mm -hmm. behind secrets too. So <laughs> I learned to mask mm -hmm. the pain. Mm -hmm. I learned to mask for pain. fear of being judged. Now, I'm going to need some tissue. Now, what you just said yes. is so many people are walking around with 
the mask. So many people walk around and they're hurting on the inside because of discrimination, because of hate, and because of unforgiving. What I want to know is, and I want to ask this, it's very important that you answer this question. Did you forgive them? Yes. Yes. You did forgive them. Yes. As a matter of fact, over the years I watched the hand that was raised to hurt my mom caress her face. And when my dad passed, um, my youngest brother and I were there with him. And I was able to say, Daddy, I love you. I release you to the Lord. It's okay for you to go home. Jesus is waiting, Mama waiting. And I'll see you when I get there. But I'm going to continue to live my life now as your child, as Mama's daughter, as their daughter, but as a child of God too. So we had reconciliation. And um, as an adult, I understood more because my dad was a teenage father, and he didn't have a role model himself. So without a role model, you know, you can choose one path versus another path. And the path that he chose uh, was destructive, but God intervened. And interestingly enough, uh, I have a sister that died in, in August of 1967. She was a juvenile diabetic. And my dad, this incident with my mom was after her death. But by Christmas time, by the end of 1967, my dad had stopped drinking. So had I done what was in my heart to do and my mind to do, I don't know what would have happened to us because it was three of us at home and my mother. So God love intervening. Yes. Because God sees the bigger picture. Yes. We see the situation mm -hmm. the way it is now. Mm -hmm. But God said, I have a purpose and a plan mm -hmm. for your mother, mm -hmm. for your father, mm -hmm. and each one of your siblings. Mm -hmm. And everybody had to play their part. Mm -hmm.